Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Prophecy Ministries for our new members Bible study. Today is Sunday, the, I don't know, I don't know. the 27th, 27th, I guess we got to start putting that in there. Let's go ahead and open with some prayer and we will dive in. So I, want to, I want the water for another day. Thank you for allowing us to wake up on this side of the sun this morning to have another chance opportunity. Father, to repent and to be here. Um, thank you so much for allowing us to hear. Thank you so much for the privilege to know you, to be known by you, Yah. Father, please teach us uh, the way of all. Father, please help us in all the areas that we don't know that we need help in, Yah. Father, we love you so much. And we're grateful unto you for all that you do. Please continue to reveal to us the areas that we that we ever in against your face, Yah, that we may have opportunity to fix it, Yah. Father, we love you so much. We're just grateful unto you for your word, for your son, for your spirit. Bless you, Abba. Awala. Ba'ashem, Yahushan. Amen. 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 All right. Let's get ready to get into it. One of the things that I want to start focusing on our new member Bible studies is showing you how to find the answer. Not just answering questions, but because I know when you leave from here, you have to answer questions. I want to start showing you how I'm finding these answers answers so that being said oh yeah good good call let's did you share it already yeah. all right online shalom to our family members that are online any questions in the room before we dive into the online portions what you got Aki you got a mic over there you ain't even got no mic well what you doing over there in the cut though <laughs> if, they, if, they, if they say something, I just say something. That's that's good thinking. That's good thinking. Just open the door and be like, what you say? <laughs> okay, go ahead. So, um, so my question pertains to uh, the scripture, Second uh, Peter chapter two, verse twenty. Second Peter chapter two, verse twenty. It reads, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our um, Adonai, and oh, would that be Yahweh? Savior? No. You're you're uh, trying to figure out how to say Savior? No, uh, because uh, it says Lord, and then it says Savior Yahweh Shai Messiah. Mm -hmm. So you need to figure out how to say Savior. Oh no no okay so it will be Adonai. And Savior. Yeah, Adonai and, and then you're looking for the Hebrew word for Savior, right? Uh, Yahusha. Yeah. Okay, is yes. that what it is? You just listening to him? I don't know. Okay, well, let's, is that your question or? Uh, no, that's not my question. Okay, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Okay. <clears throat> um, I'll just re reread it, sorry. Okay. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Adonai and Savior, Yahusha Mashiach, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse than them than the beginning. Mm, amen. Uh, so my question is like, um, so um, if a person came into the knowledge of the truth and was doing the truth and keeping the commandments, doing everything and um, had the Ruach in them and then they fell back and like turned into their vomit and uh, went back into the world, but then came back into the truth. Is that what this scripture is saying? Uh, it's not talking about them. So you added one additional step. They come into the truth. They fall back into the world. Them falling back into the world is worse for them than it, when they were in the world before. But you added they come back into the truth after. So uh, the whole goal is for everyone to come into the truth. Now, how many times does a just man fall? Seven times. Seven times. So he fell. Maybe he went back into the world, but he came back into the truth and he went back into the world. When he was in the world, it was worse for him than the first time because the first time ignorance was bliss. He didn't know any of the commandments. He didn't know the voice of the spirit speaking to him. But now that he's in the world the second time, he's being con convinced continually by the spirit not to do all of these things. Hopefully that will produce sorrow and the sorrow will produce repentance and he will come back into the truth. 
Is that this a precept for um, when the spirit comes back and it's seven times? Yes. Okay. So verse 20 is a precept for when the unclean spirit goes out of a man. Uh, he walketh through dry places, he can rest. And he says, I'm going to return to my house, which I came out. And he finds it cleaned and swept. So he goes and takes unto himself seven more spirits more wicked than himself. And the last estate of that man is worse than it was in the first. So that's the precept for that. Now let's keep reading in this chapter, verse 21, which explains verse 20. Anybody? For, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. Then, after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. So which one is better? To not know or to know and be willingly disobedient? Ignorance. Ignorance is better. Why? Because during the time of this ignorance, Yah winks at you. He gives you a pass on that. But when you know better, he expects you to do better. Does that make sense? Amen. All right, real quick. So uh, a question came up in there that you weren't intending to ask, but take me back to verse 20. I don't, I don't think that's me. Okay, it says, for if after they have escaped, it is me. Uh, bring me down just a touch. The pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Adonai. You brought me down a little too much now. Adonai and Savior. Yahweh Shai HaMashiach. So now we don't know what the word Savior is in Hebrew. So how are we going to find this word? You got to type in the search engine. We're going to go to the search engine and look for the first mention. Okay, so I'm going to the search engine. I'm typing in the word Savior. Yes, Savior, not Savor, like food delicious. Savior. Okay, and what's our first mention of this word? Second Samuel chapter 22, verse three. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Yasha. Ah, see, you were pronouncing it Yasha. <laughs> Yasha is a different thing than Yashai. It's where Yahweh Shai comes from. Go ahead and read that. Second Samuel chapter two, verse. Wait, Second Samuel chapter 22, start at verse two, please. And he said. Yahweh is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Keep going. The Allah of my rock. In him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower my and my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. Hold your finger down now on the word savior. Go to Strong's. It's made up of three characters. Now, here's the interesting part. In modern Hebrew, the first character in the alphabet, they say, is a silent letter. It's the A. Ah. So if we look at our chart over here at the very top, that top character in modern Hebrew is called an Aleph. It makes an A ah sound. But in modern Hebrew, they say the very first sound in the alphabet is silent. That don't make no sense. Why are you going to have a silent letter in the alphabet? How are you going to use that for anything? Here's another interesting thing. If you go down until you get to the Ayin character, uh, let me see if I can figure out. No, it's way down there. Don't worry about it. It's the only other character that produces in vowel sound. Guess what they say it is? Silent. Not only do they say it's silent, they say it produces the same sound as the other silent letter. So they say that their, he their, let their <clears throat> alphabet has two A sounds and both of them are silent. Does that make any sense at all? No, it, it makes no sound. The first letter makes no sound. See, it makes no sense. And, it's so, it's, and so those two that they say have no value is strength to see. Is what? Strength to see. Straight to see. No, strength to strength see. To see. To, yeah, strength to see. Yeah. You're absolutely right. That's what it would translate into. The I, the ah. Uh, the ah character means strength. And then the ayin, which is actually an I, is the ability to see. So their alphabet, they have no ability to see in there. So now, now we're taking a look at this word savior, and it is pronounced with these three characters. Three characters means it has two syllables when it's pronounced. It has a ya, a sha, and an I. Now you see how they transliterated it into yasha, because they think that the A and the I produce the same sound. 
but they don't. That would be redundant. So it is actually pronounced Yashai, like Yahweh Shai. Okay, let's see what it means. A primitive root, properly to be open, wide, or free, that is by implication to be safe, causatively to free or secure. At all, avenging, defend, deliverer, help, preserve, rescue, be safe. So now, <clears throat> let me show you something else that's interesting. Because sometimes in Hebrew, you're trying to figure out, how do I say a word? And it may already be a word that you know, because a lot of words in Hebrew, the one word has multiple meanings in English. Scroll to the bottom of the Strong's to where it says usage by word. What does, oh, wow, hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> what does secure, secure mean? S-U-C-C-O-R. Means help, aid. How, how did you know that? How did you find it? Let's fit, let's tell her how to find out them. Now that's a regular old word. You can just go into the definition of secure. Yeah, you can. So you're going to go back to your search engine and you're going to go and you're going to type in that word mm -hmm. and then you're going to look for where it was first mentioned and <clears throat> then you're going to click on the definition. That's right. So that's the way that you, so give me one second and we'll demonstrate that real quick. Usage by word for savior. What is the first? Savior is also save, saved, savior, help, delivered, preserve. So if I wanted to say rescue, I would use the exact same word that I'm going to use for savior. Everybody see that? Hallelujah. All right. So now let's demonstrate how to find the meaning of the word that you asked. The word is secure. S-U-C-C-O-U-R. O-R? Sakawa? I don't know. That's because it's not being spelled properly. S U C C O U R is what we need. Yeah, that's it. That's the English way. They have all kinds of. Oh, okay. So, so what are we typing in? We're typing in the. Uh S U C C O U R. O U R. Yes, sir. First mention is 2 Samuel 8 and 5. 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 5. Okay, go ahead and pull that one up on the screen for us. It says, and when the Syrians of Damascus came to secure, it's pronounced secure, which means secure, but secour. Had had a had a desert king of Zobah, David slew of the Syrians two and twenty thousand men. Hold your finger down on the word Sakaur. Go to Strong's. Now watch. This word is made up of three characters. That means it's pronounced with two syllables. The first character is an I. There's a Taza and there's an R. This is pronounced Izar which means help. You guys have heard of the name Ali Izar? That means Yah is my help. Izar. Okay. I don't remember. It says, go to the Strong's de definition. It says a primitive root to surround and I'm sorry, that is protect or aid. So that's how you're finding the definitions of words that you don't know the meaning of in the scriptures. I remember back in the days when I first came into the truth, this was impossible. There was no internet. I know that's difficult to imagine the idea that there is no internet. Nobody used their phone for anything other than making phone calls. And that phone was at your house <laughs> and you were rich if you had one in your uh, car, but you didn't have one in your pocket, right? So we had to carry around a giant Strong's exhaustive concordance and we would have to manually look up the definition of every single one of these words and highlight that thing and then write in the Bible the meaning of that word. It was some serious study back then. Yeah. All right. Let's get to these online questions. Is that the Strong's? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He wants to take a look at it. Go Winifred ahead. asked... Um, 
Is the transgression of desolation the same as the abomination that caused desolation in Daniel? Where are you seeing the transgression of, dom of desolation? Where's that coming from? I'll have to ask her. Yeah. Because she didn't put it in there. So in order for me to find the answer to this question, the first thing that you do when somebody asks you a question is you make sure you understand the question. The question has to be worded and formed properly in order for you to give an accurate answer. I'm not familiar with transgression of desolation, but I'm going to type that into my search engine. Okay, I found it. It's Daniel chapter 8, verse 13. Then I heard one saint speaking. And another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Okay, so we found the question that's being asked. And the second part of the question is, is the transgression of desolation the same as the abomination of desolation? The answer is no. Now, let me explain. In verse 13, he's hearing a conversation. This is Daniel hearing a conversation between other people in the spirit. Normally, he describes them as angels. Here in this place, he describes them as saints, which gives you a better picture that they may not be cherubim. They could be men also in the spirit with him. Okay, now watch this. Start reading at verse nine. No, start reading this one at verse eight. Therefore, the he goat waxed very great, and he was strong. The great horn was broken, and for it came up from notable ones. And for it came up four notable ones so one horn was broken and four horns came out of that thing he's telling a historical uh he's telling the historical tell of alexander the great and the fall of the greek empire he is that he goat and he was broken and then four kingdoms rose up out of him go ahead and out of one of them came forth a little horn the little horn is the antichrist now this is what we start off with. This is important uh, to be able to follow the number. It's in verse eight, the he goat, that's the king of Greece. He's very great. He's strong, but then the great horn gets broken. And out of the broken horn, the horn represents authority or rulership. Out of that comes four more horns toward the four winds of heaven. So they are ruling the whole earth. Now we're in the four horns. Okay, and out of one of them, out of the four horns, comes a fifth horn, a little horn. Keep going. Which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. Okay, so this little horn is Daniel's vision of the Antichrist. Keep going. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host and of the stars to, be, to the ground. And stamped upon them. That's a lot of power that this Antichrist has. He's pulling angels down out of heaven and stomping on them. Keep going. Yeah. He magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Okay. Who's the prince of the host? That's Michael. He magnified himself even to the prince of the armies. Okay. Keep going. And by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away. Who is the daily sacrifice? Yahweh Shai is the daily sacrifice. Okay? Prior to Yahweh Shai being the daily sacrifice, it was an animal. There was an animal that we had to sacrifice every single day for the sins of Israel. Yahweh Shai came and he was the last acceptable sacrifice. But because of the Antichrist, the daily sacrifice, which is Yahweh Shai, was taken away. Go ahead. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So now Jerusalem is destroyed, all because of this Antichrist little horn. Okay, verse 12. And an and host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason 
or transgression. Okay, so now the Antichrist has an army to come against Yahweh Shai because of the transgressions of men. Keep going. And he cast down the truth to the ground. What's the truth? The law. So the Antichrist has completely broken the law and put it to the ground. Go ahead. And he, and he practiced and he practiced and prospered. Okay, so now the Antichrist is practicing, and what he's practicing is his craft. Witchcraft. It's witchcraft. And he's prospering in the pra craft that he practices. Now Daniel knows all of that. And this is the conversation that Daniel overhears amongst two angels or saints. So they can be men. Go ahead. Then I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint. Okay. Spake. Now watch the certain saint that spake is John the Revelator. That's the reason why I say to you, they could be angels, but they're not. That's why he refers to them as saints. Because what he's about to say is recorded in John the Revelator's writing in Revelation. Now watch. I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake. Keep going. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trotted underfoot. The transgression of desolation is the sins that are making the land desolate. The abomination of desolation is the person who's doing it. So those things are not the same. So how long is the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? How long before he gets taken away? And how long will they continue making this sin that's going to get them thrown out of land, out of the land? to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. Everybody with that part so far? So we dove into a rabbit hole that I got to get us out of now. So hold where we are. Take a look at Revelation chapter 11, verse 2, so that you can see that John is the saint that is being spoken to in Daniel's vision. The, Go ahead. But, but the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread under the 40, uh, underfoot 40 in two months. So the question was, how long will they do this? And the answer was 40 and two months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. Okay, now let's go back to Daniel chapter eight. We're back at verse 13. It says, how long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Now take a look at verse 14. And he said unto me, until 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. 2,300 days. That's the days are counting the evenings and the mornings. Okay, uh, jump down to verse 26 so that you can see that part. Jump and, down 26, go ahead. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Okay, so he says, it's not going to happen now. The amount of time that it's going to take is 2,300 days. This is referred to as the 2,300 days of Daniel. 2,300 evenings and mornings for the whole thing to be done. Does that part make sense? Uh, it's, it's hard to describe this because Daniel is listening to a conversation between John the Revelator, and John the Revelator won't live for now another thousand years, easily another thousand years. He's not born yet. Daniel is in the spirit. John is in the spirit, and there's other multiple multiple other prophets like Ezekiel, they're all in the spirit also, and they're asking questions. And Daniel in the past says, well, how long is this going to last for? And then John in the future tells him it's going to last for 40 and two months, but the sanctuary won't be cleansed for 2,300 days. See, we got into a rabbit hole. Daniel is, uh, Daniel and Revelation are some of the most complex books in the Bible to understand. 
So I just wanted to explain the part that we were reading, but the answer to the question is no, the transgression of, of desolation and the abomination of desolation are not the same thing. One is an action and the other one is a person. Any question? Go. Sorry, I have a question that was sent to me, if I can uh, read it. Okay. Uh, it was from Phyllis. It says, I have been noticing a lot of news reports about the Sahara Desert, and I know it was mentioned yesterday at Bible study. So I did a little research, and I'm wondering if Yahweh is preparing the Sahara Desert for us to flee to the wilderness. I know we are, I'm assuming that says, supposed to say we aren't supposed to think, but follow what the word says. Are there any other scriptures that I could research? And she referenced three scriptures. Let's take a look at the scriptures. Okay. So the first one is Ezekiel 20, verses 35 through 38. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 35. Go ahead. Ezekiel 20, verse 35. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face. Keep going. Like as I plead with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith Adonai Elohim, and I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am Yahweh. Amen. So this is a great verse to start off with it because it says he's going to bring us into the wilderness. And it also that's verse 35. And then it proves in verse 38 that the wilderness is not Israel. You guys see that? Because he brings us into the wilderness, but he does not allow them to enter into the land of Israel. So the wilderness is on the outside of the land of Israel. That part makes sense. Does she have another verse? Yeah, there's two more. Okay. Um, Isaiah 43, verses 18 through 21. Isaiah 43, 18. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and the rivers, sorry, and rivers in the desert. Amen. Um, Keep it? 221. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry. Uh, the beasts of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself. They shall shew forth my praise. Amen. This, this is another great verse regarding the wilderness and the wilderness is not there right now. Uh, the place where we're going to go and receive safety and be nourished. It's not there. What's there right now is a desert. He's going to cause the climate and the environment to change as we are on the way there. So it'll, there's going to be springs and there's going to be trees and all kinds of stuff in the middle of a desolate place. Was her not nah, last verse? Uh, Revelations twelve six. These are all very good verses related to the wilderness, but uh, where it's actually located, we don't know. We don't know. Uh, two more steps, and I'm standing in the wilderness. We don't actually know that part of it, but the climate is changing all around the world with the river Euphrates drying up. With uh, like right now, they're saying. The Sahara Desert um, is more green than it has ever been before. There are things changing and growing in those places. And it's just unbelievable to them how the climate is changing. So, Revelation 12, 6, go ahead. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared for Elohim. I'm sorry, prepared of Elohim. Uh, that they should feed her there 1,203 score days. Uh, 1,000. 203 score that's 1260 days how long is that that's three and a half years using a hebrew calendar and every month has exactly 30 days okay so this number is repeated 
all over the Bible, but it's usually written when it's written in days. It works like this. It's either 1,260 days. That's um, a biblical day of 30 days per month. Of, so that gives us exactly three and a half years, or it's the other counting, which is 1,000, 1,000, hold on, 1,290 days. 1,290 days is exactly three and a half years using a modern day calendar of 31s and 30s and 28s. It's still the same amount of time which is also the same as 42 months, three and a half years, or time, times, and the dividing of time. All of those are the same thing. So the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of, of Yah, that they should feed her there for the whole great tribulation for three and a half years. Why does she need to be fed for three and a half years? Say, say it loud. Because she can't buy or sell unless she takes the mark of the beast. So the best thing that could possibly happen to her is she comes up out of the city where they're enforcing the mark of the beast and goes to a place where uh, food has already been prepared for her. Amen. So she had asked if there's any other scriptures that she could research. Yeah. Um, lots of them. But I believe... Let me see real quick. We have several videos discussing this already online. Let me just let me just take a quick peek. I'm ninety percent sure. There is a video on our channel called uh, Let me find it. It's called Preparing to Flee. Or what's that one? Preparing? Oh. You search in there. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's called Preparing to Flee, which will give many more precepts and understanding regarding. Yeah, Preparing to Flee to the Mountains, Preparing for the Tribulation Series. Uh, I believe there's five videos in there preparing. Yeah. Uh, right. So there's there's a Preparing for Tribulation Series on our channel that has... 10 videos in it and all of them are talking about preparing to flee to the mountains and to the wilderness. So that's the best place to get that information. Another question. Okay. So Sarah Halstick, Halsketter. Yeah. Told her, I'll just pronounce the first name. Anyway, she um, actually began it's a, quite a bit and it's talking about her perception of 13 uh, months. And her trying to get, so she said, basically in a nutshell, in short, I'm asking how to get the year started on the right day and what to do and what we, and what to do with the spare days that always come up since the moon and the sun have different cycles and years and lengths because she came from witchcraft and other things where she was looking at signs and things in a different way mm -hmm. and also... <clears throat> following a 13th month calendar uh, layout. And so, so she's just trying to get it right. Okay. So what's the question that we need to ask? What we say again? It, it does. It does. It does matter. It does matter. What's a, show me this 13 month calendar. Cause there is no, there's the only 12 months in all of the 66 books and all the Jubilees and all of Jasher and all of Enoch, there's only 12 months. So in order to answer this question, we have to say, where are we getting this 13th month from? Then we can begin to say, okay, well, the source of this information is accurate or it's not. Okay. So let me uh, help with a couple places where you can start to get your days and time Go ahead. She says she's been on the Zadok. Zadok. E Zadok and yeah. Enoch calendar. Okay. Where on the Enoch calendar does it pull out 13 months? Does it? She, she began to talk about that as it relates to a particular group of people who added a 13th month. Yeah. So, so that combination, she knows it. She's talking about her confusion. Right. She's so trying the, to get it clear. The confusion stems from believing something that's not written in the scriptures. Because you know what I'm going to do tomorrow? I'm going to make a 14th month. 
Who down to follow it? Would you go write a it? write a check to capital P R O? What you say? What I'm gonna call it? You go, what, you what, what you gonna call it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think I think it's amazing too that uh, in Exodus uh, 12, uh, it talks about what the first in the first month what the first the the first month is in the beginning of be the beginning of the year. Amen. But it's also in 12. Mm -hmm. also, yeah, that's Exodus 12. go to Exodus chapter 12. And let's read verse 2. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Okay. So this month is the beginning of months. That means there's no month before this month. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, here's a part of the confusion. Uh, people who practice Judaism, they, their book says this but they don't keep that. They think that the first month is Rosh Hashanah, which is the seventh month because Rosh means head. Hashanah of the year, head of the year. That's what Rosh Hashanah means. We don't celebrate Rosh Hashanah because we believe that the beginning of the year is in the month of Abib. Now, Exodus chapter 12, verse two, it did not tell you that it was the month of Abib, did it? Go to... Go to chapter 13, verse 4. 13, 3, and 4. Exodus chapter 13, verse 3. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which he came out of Egypt, out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand, Yahweh brought you out from this place. There shall no living bread be eaten. What is the day when I don't get to eat leavened bread? On the 15th day. What's the first day that I don't get to eat leavened bread? On Passover, which is on the 14th day of the first month of the year. Read verse 4. Then came ye out in the month of Bib. Okay, so I came out. It says, this day came ye out in the month of Bib. So a, a Bib is the first month of the year. And I came out of Egypt on the 15th day. After the Passover, I had to put the blood on my door. And then the next day is when we went out. Does that make sense? Okay. What is the sign that must take place on that day? There has to be a full moon on that day. The Bible says so. So this, the Bible has clues for you to figure out if you're keeping the right timetable or not. How do you? I don't understand the question. Say the question in the mic. How do I know when a bib is? She, she says, I never understood the Hallel Rahash like that. Okay. Uh, just how to do, <laughs> how do you know when that month begins? So the 12th month is in February 28th, 25th, 2025. That's the 12th month. The, the, the new moon, the new of, the moon of the 12th month, month is on February 28th, 2025. That is correct. So the, be, the first month of the next year is going to be March uh, 1st. That night is going to be the new moon of the first. And that's where we would start our count for um, Passover. And then that's where we're going to begin creating the, key, the next year's calendar. We, we will have the calendar before then, but let me explain. So uh, tr in trying to figure out how to determine that, there is an app that we use called Moon Phase Calendar. Moon Phase Calendar is a free app. Inside the app, it will allow you to select where in the world you want to find out what time it is according to the moon. We go in and we type Jerusalem because Jerusalem is on the African continent. So it is the same time in real Jerusalem as it is in fake Jerusalem. Okay. So that's how we know what time it is. And it tells us exactly when the 1% of the moon begins to shine in that location. So, and it's accurate. So if I know on this date, there will be 2% moon shining on that month. I can say this is the first day of that month. And then I count from there. 14 days and say this is when we celebrate the passover and the next day i check my app 
and it must be a full moon on the 15th. If it's not a full moon on the 15th, then something's wrong with my count. So there are two markers that you're going to use to verify every month, which is the first light of the moon and the appearance of the full moon. The full moon, regardless of what day number it is, it can be the 27th day. It, it's actually the 15th day of the Most High's month. Does everybody understand that part? So I want you to imagine that it is June 8th on a Julian calendar, but it could also be the 15th day of that particular month because the, the calendars are not identical. One is superimposed over the other one. Does everybody understand that part so far? What you got? Ike? So just uh, being observant <clears throat> in um, this year, the, the Passover moon, and then the moon that just passed for the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, those two moons were significantly different. You, you, you can, out of all the other, the other months yeah. that I've been paying attention it, to. It's a different those, moon. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it's a if, big. If, you, if you're watching, yeah. it's a significantly different moon. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Amen. So uh, the first thing for answering the sister's question is, um, don't believe it if you can't read it, right? If it's something that somebody said 14 months, 15 months, be like, show me. That's the first thing. Let me do this thing like a child. Okay. As a child, I know that there are 12 months. The Bible tells me that there are 12 months. The Bible does not tell me that there are 13 months. If we go into Jubilees, it's going to tell you there's 12 months and there is exactly 364 days. If you put 365 days in your year, you're going to go off on every single one of your feast days. He says it must be that way. Go ahead. Okay, so she is um, still speaking of uh, the moon being on a different circuit. But then she mentions particularly, so last month it was just, so last month we'll just have a second moon phase in it since there are 13 moons in our solar year what you're making reference to is the teachings of witchcraft astrology and astronomy you have to empty the cup so that you can pour some good wine into it what you got I'm talking to mike mm -hmm, prove it did she oh yes absolutely so there is a video on our channel called Proving the New Moon. And it's very detailed. It's going to tell you when the year starts, when the month starts. What you got, Ike? Talking to Mike. No. I just kind of picked up that uh, 7 doesn't go into 365. It goes into 364 perfectly. 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 Yeah, it won't go into 365. Yeah. That's the reason why the scripture says, like, we have to keep track of the days because days is all we have. Right. All we have is time to get this thing right. And it's like, stop wasting your time and stop adding to it. You trying to add an extra day. You prolonging the inevitable. Right. And that is the highest form of procrastination. Right. And I also picked up, like, it talks about they, they, thought, themsel they thought themselves to change the time. So it mm. makes sense why the, the season changes are a little bit delayed. Yes. It's hotter in the fall or something like that. Yeah. So, Kind of shows that everything regarding over. time so whoever controls the time really controls a lot of stuff right the idea of time like the greenwich clock you guys know the clock is in england they control the time whatever that whole big ben thing the, the doomsday clock are you guys familiar with that it keeps getting closer and closer to midnight because when midnight comes when they're talking about closer and closer to midnight they're talking about the return of the messiah Right, because he's coming at midnight according to the scriptures. So the video is called Go ahead. Oh yeah, so the two videos is proving the full moon is not the new moon. And then there's another one called Understanding the New Moon. And I would also recommend watching the twenty twenty four Hebrew uh feast day calendars. That will yeah. clear up some things too. Yeah. Amen. Quick question. Are yes. all the names of all twelve moons in the scriptures? Months? Months. No. All 12 months are not in the scriptures. Which one is it that we don't have? The fourth and fifth month, the fourth and fifth month are not named in the scriptures. Yeah. For the rest, yes. 
No, we don't know. I can make it up. One of them's Scooby, the other one is Shaggy. Because if you go make up something, you might as well make it, you know, make it creative. It's Scooby. It's Scooby. It's Scooby and Shaggy. Just making up stuff. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yes. It is, I think my mic's a little high. No, you're good. You're good. Exodus 24. Exodus chapter 24. Okay. Um, it is, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or... Which images. verse are you in? Oh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Yeah, 20. Exodus chapter Sorry. 20. Verse four. As you guys know, I was in Exodus chapter 24 waiting for the verse. <laughs> okay. Sorry. It's okay. Go ahead. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Okay. So my question is, um, uh, how does that relate to... Um, so is it speaking for like any graven image or does it, is, is it forbidding anything made in the image of anything or is it, does it have to be worshipped, bowed down to? Or? How do we find the answer to her question? In the word, definitely in the word. And so the question is based on a scripture. Take a look at that scripture. Is there a period at the end of it? So the idea is not complete, right? So that means there's some more information that is necessary in order for you to keep that commandment. Now let's read verse five, because in verse four, it says, don't make it. Okay. Verse five, it says. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, mm. nor serve them. For I, Yahweh, the Allah, I am, and the jealous Allah, I am, visit the, iniqu the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Okay. Keep going, because that one's not a period either. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. There's our period. So now let's go back and analyze verse 4. It says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. What does graven mean? Carved, form, molten. It's You bring it into a physical existence of any likeness of anything. Okay, and then it gives you the three places. Heaven, earth, and water. So... Is it saying that I cannot make those things only? It's saying I can't make them and I cannot worship them. Does that part make sense? Okay, so what would I be making it for? I'm just going to twist this up and look, there's a shark. Do, 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 do. There's a shark. And then I say that this shark is God. <laughs> it, took, it took you all a second to get the baby shark out of there. Okay, do, 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 do. okay watch. So, when I begin to worship this, what happens? I made it into an idol. Okay, but what if I didn't worship it? I just carved it. What does the scripture say? We know that an idol is nothing in the world and there is none other God but one. Does that make sense? Okay, so name something in the heaven above that people make idols of. Small statues. Mary. Mary Mary ain't in heaven that's what, that's How did Mary think. get up in here I know they think that they think that Angels but those those don't, those are men with wings Little babies naked babies flying around with wings That's not an angel You ain't never seen no angel to make an image of it In fact what have you actually Seen that is in heaven That you could make an image of bird. There's no doves in heaven In the heavens bird. When it, Okay, Yahweh Shai, he's in heaven. And if you tried to make a picture of him, that'd be a graven image. But you guys know that this uh, menorah is in heaven and the tabernacle's in heaven and the table of showbread and all of those things are in heaven. You're not supposed to worship those things. Okay, what about in the earth? Name something that's in the earth that people make images of and worship. Man. Crosses, Man. trees, yeah. Yeah. moon, stars. Molten calf, right? All those different things. What about under, uh, what about in the water? Fish. fish. Dagon, that little fish on the back of the car, that whole thing. Okay. <laughs> What'd you say? 
Starbucks logo. Starbucks logo. Hey, Teletubbies. I don't know what what the siren. The siren. S -s Supposedly siren. So that's what it's referring to, but it's for the purpose of worshiping those things, right? Because watch, let me show you the precept. Acts chapter 17, verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of Allah. So watch, if we're the offspring of Yah, and we don't look like goats and crosses and all those things, why would he think why would we think that he looks like that? We're his children. For then, for as much then as we are the offspring of Yah, go ahead. We are not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stones graven by the art and man's device. There's no reason for us to think that anything other than us could be a representation of what he looks like when we're his children. If you see my son, my son looks like me. If you saw some white kid walking across the street, there would be no reason for you to think that that's my son. He don't look like me. So if we are the children of the most high, why would we think that, oh, that bird or that fish is a picture of the most high? I digress. I was going to say that if you haven't seen the Ten Commandments series, uh, Pastor breaks down all of them really, really well in that series. The water. Back to the online questions. Um, I need the, uh Anesia. Anesia. Okay. Um, the world in John three sixteen is it world as in the entire world? Hamashiach says in John that our Father has given to him those that are meant to be given, indicating not all were meant to be given. Uh, give me so, that last part that she said again. Okay. Yabashai said what? Uh, Hamashiach said in John that our Father has given to him those that are meant to be given, mm -hmm. indicating not all were meant to be given. Okay. Okay, so the first part is, let's cover John 3.16. The world is not what you think it is. There have been many worlds since the world was created. Does that make sense? Okay, there is an ancient world. There is a uh, bronze world. There is an animal world. There's world of curls. There's world on wheels. <laughs> I'm just clowning now, but he says sea world. That's right. Those are all different worlds. When he is speaking in John chapter three, verse 16, he's speaking of a specific world according to the scriptures. Okay. John chapter three, verse 16. Go ahead. For all the higher soul of the world that, that he gave. His only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So what is this world that he loved so much that he gave it to his son and his son to it? What is that world? Because it, if he's talking about the whole world and everybody in it, then there's a contradiction in the scriptures. The scripture says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. It's Yasharal. It's Israel. Israel is the world according to the scriptures. Go to Isaiah chapter 45 verse 17 and it will prove to you that Israel is the world. But Yasharah shall be saved in Yahweh with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. So what did he just call Israel? He called Israel the world without end. Which world did he love? The world without end. He loved Israel. So who did he give his son to? The whole world? No, he gave his son to Israel and he gave Israel to his son. Okay. Now go to Ephesians chapter 3 verse 21. And even in the New Testament, it tells you that Israel is the world. Ephesians 3.21. Go ahead. Unto him be glory in the church by Hamashiach Yahweh 
throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Who is the world without end? It's Israel. Why is Israel the world that doesn't have an end? Because the Most High made a promise to Israel. Did he promise everybody? Did he promise Japheth anything? No, he didn't promise anybody else anything, just Israel. Okay, now watch this. Go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Huh? You had that verse, you, but you didn't say it. Look, stop, 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 grieve, stop grieving the spirit. Go on and say it when you got it. <laughs> she got scared. Don't be scared to say your verses. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yahawashai, for he shall save his people from their sins. Does it say he's going to save everybody from all of their? No, it says his people. His people is Israel. He's going to save his people from their sins. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, let me show you this one real quick. Because that John 3.16 said, For Yah so loved the world. Okay. Go to Proverbs chapter 8 verse 17. That's the precept for John 3.16. I love them that love me. Who does he love? He loves, the, loves them that love him. They don't say I love everybody and they can do whatever they want. Amen. It says I love them that love me. Go ahead. And those that seek me early shall find me. Okay. So if he loves them that love him, how do they know if they love him? They keep his commandments. They keep his commandments. John 14, 15. That's how you know if he loves you, you keep his commandments. Does that make sense? All right. Was there any other parts of that question? What you got, Kyle? Ephesians what? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5. Talking to Mike. And it, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it speaks of uh, the, I guess, uh, it would be grace being given um, out further than, as uh, in 6 it says, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Amen. Go to Ephesians chapter 3, and let's begin reading at verse 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3. Because this was a mystery that, what's up? This is a mystery that was hidden to the children of Israel for ages and ages, which was always the plan from the very beginning. If it wasn't the plan from the very beginning, then that means that the most high changes and the scripture says that he doesn't change. Okay. Ephesians chapter three, verse three. How that by revelation, he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote it for in few words. So this is Paul speaking. And he's, uh, he's saying that by revelation, Yahweh Shai made known to him the mystery. Verse 4. Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Hamashiach. So he says there is a mystery that all of Israel doesn't understand. But he revealed it to me. That's what made me the apostle to the Gentiles. The mystery is that they're going to receive salvation also. Two reasons. They understand what faith is. And Israel is disobedient and needs to be provoked into doing the right thing. Okay, keep going. Verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Okay, so the mystery, which is the Gentiles being heirs of the kingdom, was not made known unto the sons of men. No one knew this, even though it was written repeatedly throughout the scriptures. As it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit. Now verse 6. Here's the mystery. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. What does that mean? We covered that yesterday. Yep. They get some inheritance, don't they? They get some inheritance. And of the same body. What body? Is the body become Gentile or is the body Israel? It's Israel. The body is Israel and they get grafted to the body. Hallelujah. And partakers of his promise in Hamashiach by the gospel. They must believe the good news. 
The good news for us is not the same good news as it is for Gentiles. The good news for us is that we can be reconciled. This is the ministry of reconciliation for Israel. The good news for Gentiles is you don't have to go into the lake of fire because the kingdom was not prepared for Gentiles from the foundation of the world. It was prepared for us and he cast us off. Our good news is we can be reconciled. Somebody came and demonstrated exactly how to love the most high, the way the most high wants to be loved. The good news for Gentiles is now you can receive salvation because your faith is so strong. Learn how to keep these commandments. Become as one born in the land. Hallelujah. Let's keep reading. Verse, verse 7. Wherefore. Whereof. Whereof. I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of Allah given unto me by the effectual working of his power. He says, it's only the grace of the Most High that made me a minister to the Gentiles. Because, you guys, this is Paul talking, and Paul was a hardcore Hebrew Israelite. He was willing to kill people. Right. right? Think about that for a second. He's willing to kill people. And now he's out telling other nations that they can come into the kingdom. That's a huge transformation right there. Verse 8. Unto me, who who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given so the grace was given to paul and he's the least of all of the saints go ahead that i should preach among the gentiles the unsearchable riches of hamashiach one more verse in this section and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery okay the fellowship of the mystery everybody needs to come into being able to see the fellowship of the mystery if it was only Israel that was going to be saved, the promise to Abraham would be broken. He would not be the father of many nations. So how is Abraham going to be the father of many nations unless the Gentiles get grafted in, the strangers begin to sojourn? That's been a mystery. How, think about this for a second. How is Abraham going to be the father of many nations when Israel is only one nation? People have been wondering that for years and years and years. Now, when Christians grabbed a hold of that, they said, well, it's us. Okay, but first of all, Christianity is not a nation. It's a religion. So you're not fulfilling even the basic requirements. Because this thing is talking about nationality. It doesn't say he's going to be the father of all religions. Make sense? He's going to be the father of all nations. Those nations are going to come in sojourning, learning the commandments, and then be grafted in and partakers of the root. And that is a mystery that nobody knew. Until Paul began to write his writings, nobody understood how he was going to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So read verse 9 from the top one more time. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hid. In Allah, who created all things by Yahweh HaMashiach. Amen. So it says from the beginning, that was the plan. It was always the plan that he would be the father of many nations, that the, the kingdom would be all nations, kindreds, tongues, all these different people. That was always the plan. Amen. Amen. Questions online? Is it cold in here? Y'all are shaking y'all head. Um, Victoria. I'm sorry. Hold on real quick. Say that again, Kyle. You mean verse 10? Verse 10 and 11. Yes, we can keep it. Okay. Verse 10. Go ahead. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Pause there. What's a principality and what's a power? It is a spirit principalities and powers and th thrones and dominions are all different classes of angels it says to the intent so that means this is his intention that the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of yah does that make sense keep going so he did all of this and revealed it at this time so that everyone can know that he is yah you guys know he can do anything he wants right but he'll never do anything that contradicts. Keep going. Verse 11. According to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Hamashiach, Yahweh Shai, or Adonai. Okay, what is the eternal purpose of Yahweh Shai, Hamashiach? What is his eternal purpose? What is his name? Salvation. Salvation. That's his purpose. Your name is your purpose. 
So would he really be salvation if he only saved a handful? If some of the ones that the father gave him got plucked out of his hand, would he really be salvation? He said, my father gave them to me and no man is able to get them out of my hand. So I'm going I'm to I'm succeed at what I came to do. Amen. Amen. You still have a question, Kyle? Um, I, I think that it's a good thing to explain what manifold is for everybody. That way they understand that it's Israel that's divine. Go ahead. What is manifold? Um, well, let's go to the Strong's definition. That way I'm using the same stuff. Okay. So we're going to Strong's. And, uh, it's from and much variegated. As in multifarious. Yeah. Multifarious. That means many faceted. There's so many different signs, like, like an onion. There's so many different layers that have to be pulled back in order for you to get to this thing. Manifold. It's uh, much varied is a simple way of saying it. Amen. All right. Questions in the room? Questions online. Let's get it. Okay. Victoria says, can we review John 19 verses... 26 to 30. She says, it, 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 to me it seems that when Yahawashai said, it is finished, it directly relates to him telling Mary, behold your son, and John, behold your mother. Could that be a preset for the scripture that says, religion is caring for widows and fatherless? I see what's being said here. Um, so they're taking the, it is finished as the mission. And then saying the mission was finished when he passed along his mother to John and saying that's the caring for the widows and the fatherless. Um, so I see that being put together and that's not a bad thing, but that's not what's being said in the scriptures. What's actually being said in the scriptures is, is quite a bit more complicated than that, but that can be seen in the scriptures. Let's take a look. John chapter 9, verse 26. When Yahushua therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold, thy son. Okay. When So Yahushua is there and he sees his mother. What's his mother's name? Mary, and he sees a disciple whom he loves. What's his name? John. John. So Mary and John are standing there at the crucifixion, and he says, woman, who's he talking to? Mary, behold thy son. Is he saying, look at me? He's saying, look at John. You guys are family now. Keep going. 27. Then saith he to the disciple, behold thy mother, and from that hour... That disciple took her unto his own home. Okay. So uh, now this is where I was saying that can be seen what the person is suggesting. However, uh, is there a widow in this story? No. There's no widow. There's no homeless. There's no. Mm. Mary's not a widow though. Maybe they are. Okay. What? Does she really? They really do that? Say that in the mic. <laughs> I will say that in the mic. Pastor Porkchop teaches you that Mary was a widow and that Joseph was dead from the time of Yahweh Shai's ministry. They do teach you that in church. Wow, I've never heard that before. Well, well they taught me that in my church. In the movies too, you never see and, Joseph. That's true, huh? The only time you see Joseph is in Luke when it's, you know, the, the star and the, you know, the... the they teach that he was dead. I didn't know that. that he was dead. Yeah, that's, that's wild. <laughs> yeah. Well, there. if he wasn't, why would he... If, if he wasn't dead, mm -hmm. why would he give his mother to someone else? To, to a, a new son? To John. Yeah, because so her actual son is dying 
and he's being replaced by another son that's able to take care of her. But if she has a she husband. Has lots of, uh, but it does say from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Right. So, so where was Joseph? I don't know. Wow. The scripture don't say that. But they teach you that. Yeah. I, I, did, I had no idea. Who knew? Who knew? Who knew they was making up stuff? Doesn't so when the Messiah is uh, taken to a tomb, isn't that Joseph's tomb that's prepared for him and his homeland? That's, that's a different Joseph. That's Joseph of Arimathea. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. All right, man. No, we just restarted the stream. Okay, yeah. it's because we keep on saying key words and they're shutting it down. <laughs> click, <laughs> click. I don't, I don't know, I don't know. Hopefully, you guys are still there. If you're, if you're, <laughs> shrimp, Pastor Shrimp cocktail. As soon as you said that, that's when people started getting kicked out. Wow. Oh, video is gone. Did you restart it? You gonna restart it again? Yeah. If there's nobody in there, restart it again and then share it again and. All right. Yes. Let's uh, regroup. Questions. Y'all came from far. What questions do you have? They're they're saying they're in there. We just restarted the stream again. Go ahead and reshare. And next question, please. I, I saw a question in there earlier. Is that okay? Someone asked, is Bathsheba black? In the chat. Okay. Earlier. Sometimes when people ask questions, I'd be like, why are you asking this question? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's a bad question. It's just... Yeah, fear him and keep these commandments. Okay, you guys ready? Uh, who is Bathsheba? Who is Bathsheba? Right, whom David stole. Okay, so that they're probably asking about the wrong person. There's a Bathsheba and there's Queen of Sheba. I've never heard anyone ask if Bathsheba was black. Right. Why would someone ask if Bathsheba was black? That's random. Now, was the queen of Sheba black? Yes. Clearly she was because she's the queen of Ethiopia. Well, she said I'm black and I'm humble. Yes, the scripture says so. So, all right. That's not a bad one. It's just sometimes I'm like, so I always imagine, like imagine you, you go into a coffee shop and you sit down at a table and you're, you got your tea or your coffee and you got your Bible there. And a man comes and sits down at the table. And as you're looking at him, there's so much light coming off of his face that you can't see any of his features. You can just hear his voice and you know you're in the presence of somebody special, somebody divine. And they sit down at the table and they say, five minutes, go. That means you can ask any question you want to ask. But when the five minutes are up, that's it. I'm not good. There's a whole lot of questions that I'm not going to ask. He's going to answer the questions for five minutes. You got to keep the questions very simple and they need to be important questions, Time's right? Up. what you got? Time's, right? up. Time's up. <laughs> Time's up. Right? right? Cause we, okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, Serena asks, uh, can you explain what the meaning of Isaiah 43, 19 is? Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19. We read this earlier today. So somebody should definitely be able to do that. Behold, I will do a new thing. And now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Okay. We read that verse earlier, right? Okay. So 
Because we read it earlier, what is this verse talking about? Talk about providing for us in the wilderness. He's talking about changing the climate and environment in the desert into a place that flourishes. He refers to it as a new thing. Go to Isaiah chapter 48, verse 6. No, nope, verse 5. This is for our inhabitation and for our comfort during that time? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Isaiah 48, 5. Go ahead. I have even from the beginning declared it to thee. He says, from the very beginning, I told you. Why am I telling it to you before it happens? So that you will know that I said it. Right? You won't think, oh, that's good. Look, it just happened. He's like, no, I, I wrote it from the very, very beginning what I was going to do. Go ahead. Before it came to pass, I shoot at thee, mm. lest thou should say, my idol hath done them, and my graven image, and my molten Im image hath commanded them. So why does the Most High tell you what he's going to do before he does it? So that you don't give the credit to some false god. Hallelujah. Okay, one more verse, verse 6. Thou hast heard, see all this. And will not ye declare it? I have shown thee new things from this time, mm. even hidden things, and thou didst not know them. He said, I shewed thee new things from this time. I showed you things right now. I'm showing you the things that I'm planning to do. That's what a prophecy is. Even hidden things, and thou didst not know them. You didn't know none of the stuff that I was planning to do, but I showed it to you so that you could tell people. Verse 7. They are created now and not from the beginning. Mm. Even before the day when thou heardest them not, lest thou should say, Behold, I knew them. So he does these things so that nobody can receive any credit. Nobody can say, I knew he was going to do that. You didn't know he was going to do that. Amen. Hallelujah. Other than the fact that he told you he was going to do it. So all you knew is what he told you. Does that make sense? Amen. That's the explanation of that Isaiah 43. So there's 19. no mistaking. There's no mistaking. There's no mistaking. Yeah. He's not going to give his glory to somebody else. He's jealous. Right? What else do we have? I have a quick question. Yes, please. Um, when you go to um, 1 Thessalonians 4.17, I heard you say that we don't poop up. But when I look at this, it says... Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we be, shall, shall we ever be with the Lord? And I have a lot of friends who think we're poofing up. They think they're poofing. So we cover and this I one. I want to go with them. Oh, you want to get poofed too. I can't lie. I want to get poofed, but I'm poof proof. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Just explain that to me. Okay. Well, so we've covered this one many times, right? So one of you guys should be able to explain it and I will provide precepts if needed. Go ahead. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse 17. Go ahead, somebody. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet Adonai in the air. And so shall we ever be with Adonai. Okay, how do we explain that? Is that talking about you getting poofed from one place up into the clouds and in the air? No, sir. We're going to have to take a journey to the top of the mountain, like back in the days of Sinai, and meet him on the top of the mountain. Hallelujah. Okay. okay. Very good. It doesn't really say that. Um. Yeah. So, and caught up means what? I know some people out here in these streets getting caught up, <laughs> but they're not getting poofed. <laughs> they're not getting poofed. Okay, so can we go to Exodus nineteen nine? Perfect. Exodus nineteen nine. It's going to show you how that thing happened before, and that's going to let you know how it's going to happen again because that thing which hath been is that thing which shall be. So we're looking for an instance in the Bible where we were. Up in the clouds, in the air, with the Most High before, and we'll see how did we get there. 
And Yahweh said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto Yahweh. Amen. Jump down to verse 11. 13. Oh, you got it? Okay. Verse what? 11. No, you tell them. You tell, I'm just going to sit here. Verse 11. Okay. And be ready against the third day. For the third day, Yahweh will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. 13. And thou shalt sit bound. 13? Mm -hmm. There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. Does it say they get poofed up to the mount? Nope. They shall come so up to when the we're reading in Thessalonians, it also talks about the trumpet sounding the last trumpet, and then we meet the Lord in the air. Here it says, when the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. Let's find out if they're going to get poofed from the bottom to the top. Let's jump to 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud. There's the cloud. Upon the mount. Mm -hmm. And the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that, were, that, that was in the camp trembled. Keep going. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with Elohim. Did they get poofed? No, sir. He, he walked them there. Go ahead. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. What's nether mean? Uh, nether. The, the lower nether. It's underneath the nether part. They're at the bottom of the mountain. Keep going. Verse 18. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke. Because Yahweh descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And when the whole mount quaked greatly. Keep going. And when, Yahweh, and when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and Elohim answered him by, by a voice. Verse 20. And Yahweh came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and Yahweh called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. Did he poof Moses from the bottom to the top? No. So up. Moses walked up this mountain, and as he's walking into the mountains, the top of the mountain, what's around him? He sees the clouds. Clouds. And where is he at? He's in the air. That doesn't mean his feet are off the ground. Just because you're in the air doesn't mean your feet are off the ground. But this is also the first mention of trumpets in the Bible. Absolutely. All right. All right. So still no poofing. Tell your friends. Tell your friend no poof. Um, this question is coming up again today as it was the other day. People keep asking about sea moss and seaweed and seeing if it's unclean or not. And I know we've had a discussion the other day. They keep being given scriptures as it relates to um, seed bearing like trees and plants and the thought process being only those things that have seeds. And <clears throat> I was processing this and having a conversation about it. Algae actually is a spore and it produces of its same kind. That's what it does, simply as a seed does the same thing. Also, no one can tell me where lettuce sprouts its seeds, yet right. we eat lettuce, right? It's not an unclean thing but it does produce its same thing and so people are telling people no it's unclean sea moss and seaweed but the bible does not say that and it does produce its same kind of so thing the okay. people need to provide a scripture if it says it's unclean because the scriptures clearly give us everything that's unclean for people to eat and they're giving them scriptures utilizing the seed bearing trees you know, fruit that bears seeds. But that's not related. It's not. Right. So if, mm -hmm. if something is unclean to eat, please provide the scripture that says it is unclean to eat. This is not about seeds and all of that stuff. Because go to Leviticus chapter 11, verse 2. I don't even understand why we're talking about vegetation when he uses a very specific word to tell you regarding food, what's clean and unclean. There is no unclean vegetation in the Bible. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts. Pause. These are the plants? It says beasts. And this whole chapter is going to tell you about beasts. And when it gets down into the water, it's going to say, Of those that are in the water, 
It's talking about the fish, the beasts, the things that have life, not the sea moss, not the seaweed. It's not talking about that. That's literal example of adding to the word. And then what would be the purpose of that? Are you trying to help somebody stop eating something that's bad for them? Or are you trying to demonstrate how much you know when you can't even provide one scripture to back up what you're saying? That doesn't make any sense that someone, we have to keep discussing this thing over and over. There's not a scripture that says that there is any unclean vegetation. And regarding the scriptures, regarding the seed being in itself and all of that stuff, that's not related to what we can eat. So this is how we deal with this. What is the subject we're actually talking about? Food. Does that make sense? Clean and unclean food. Clean and unclean food is found in Leviticus chapter 11, and it only relates to meat, to animals. Does that, does that make sense? I saw, I saw the same person asked about eating raw fish and sushi like does it have blood in it that type of thing that's a good question um so does a fish have blood fish do have blood yes no no no, no it's not they, possible fish do have blood but they don't have as much blood as that's right. a mammal does or a beast and it runs out a lot faster than um uh, an uh, animal like but they do have yes, blood do. okay so if there's a question about eating something with the blood, that's totally different than eating clean versus unclean. I'm going to eat a clean fish, but I'm going to eat it raw. And there's a possibility that the blood could still be in it. I'm not going to eat that. If you decide that you're going to eat that, that's totally between you and the most high. I'm not a judge between anybody, but I'm not going to eat it. So I don't eat sushi. So, um, when you, um, so this topic is going to be really important, especially when we're in the wilderness, because you're not going to be able to go to a grocery store and just buy your meat and then take it home. We're going to actually have to kill that thing. Yeah. And when it says in the scriptures um, that there's no, that the blood is the life, um, when you kill that thing and you drain out all the blood out of it, you're required to cook it as well. You can't eat that thing raw. That's what That's right. in Genesis, when it says that they ate, they killed the animal and right there they started eating the animal mm. with the blood still in it. Mm. That's what it's talking about. He's showing us a process of how we're supposed to do things and we're supposed to apply that when we go into the wilderness. So it's very important to do all of those things and to know what we're supposed to do because there's not going to be grocery stores. You have to drain it out and you have to cook that thing to be sure. There's no... Um, I think or anything like that, especially when it comes to this. Let's just err on the side of caution and cook it. Don't eat um, anything raw. What verse is that for you have to cook it? Can you give me that verse? So the verse does not specifically say that you have to cook it. Um, the, the verse says specifically that you cannot eat it with the blood. The example of it is if you don't cook the blood out of it, then you can't eat it. This is the story of Jacob and Esau. Esau comes in from the field and he's faint. And Jacob sawed pottage, which means he's boiling some pottage. And it's red. It's red because there's still blood in it. It has not cooked entirely away. And Esau says, feed me with that same red pottage. I want to eat it now. He says, I'm at the point to die. Jacob says, sell me your birthright. And he says, if I die, what good is the birthright? And then we have to go all the way to the book of Hebrews to find out the reason why the meat was red or the, the pottage was red because people will say lentils are red. The scripture says there was one morsel of meat in there. So he sold his birthright for a morsel of meat, which was not entirely cooked. So the Bible doesn't say you have to cook it because what if I, I dry it? I can dry this thing out. There's a bunch of different ways to prepare it. Remember, we didn't have refrigerators. So if we went fishing and we caught a gang of fish, we're not going to cook all of it right now. We're going to take some salt and we're going to pack it and we're going to dehydrate this thing to the best of our ability and travel to the next place with it. So I just want to be clear. The Bible doesn't say you have to cook it. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, in most sushi places, they blanch the fish to make sure there's no bacteria, tapeworms, etc. in the fish. Mm. Um, they don't really serve it like 
bloody fresh. Right. It's, it's not really raw. Yeah, it's right. just not right. It's not cooked. Take a look at verse 9 in Leviticus chapter 11. This part is important because I, I'm, I'm just surprised that this question keeps coming up. I'm like, do you actually eat sea moss? Do you, you do? You do? And it's delicious, huh? Okay. You good? Good. Good. That's cool. Cool. And you eat, and y'all eat the mushrooms too, huh? I knew there was a fungus among us. Mushrooms are full of vitamin D. Yep. Vitamin dirt. That's what that D stands for. That's why they taste like that. Press the button. You about to ask about the mushrooms? I don't want none. I don't want no mushrooms, no anchovies. Get them lines, man. Go ahead. What does the scripture say about like you can't eat the mushrooms? The Bible doesn't talk no. about mushrooms. People are saying that it's unclean to eat mushrooms based on their own interpretation, and it's a private interpretation. They're using that to say because mushrooms don't produce seeds. They do. Producing seeds, even if they do or they don't, producing seeds is not one of the requirements for, for it to unclean. be clean and uh, clean. It's not. That's so, adding to the word. In Genesis one twenty nine, this is what they're talking about. Okay, let's when go there. Goes, talks about the seeds. Genesis chapter one verse twenty nine. Go ahead. And Yah said, "Behold, I have given every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree." And which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you shall it be for meat. That means food, right? Okay. Does it say that you can't eat other stuff? It doesn't say that you can't eat other stuff. He's just telling you. Go back to Leviticus chapter 11, verse 9. Verse nine. Okay. Y'all okay? You, y'all cracking up over there. It's okay. Let us laugh too. These shall you eat of all that are in the waters. Okay. Whatsoever hath fins, scales in the waters, fins and scales in the waters, in the seas and in the rivers, them shall ye eat. Okay. What about Leviathan? Guess what Leviathan has? He's got scales. He's got fins and scales. That's why we're going to eat him. He is meat for the children of Israel. He has fins and scales. Watch this. Verse 10. And all that have not fins and scales in the sea and in the rivers and all uh -uh, read that right and in the river uh -huh. rivers of all that move in the waters. okay does that move that means that it's alive that means it's an animal it moves in the water sea moss is not an animal it's a plant right watch keep going and of any living thing which is in the waters they shall be an abomination unto you. So that means any animal that lives in the water that does not have fins and scales is an abomination for you to eat it. That's a catfish. That's a shrimp. That's a crawdad. That's a squid. That's a lobster. That's mussels. That's right. That's clams, shark. All of that stuff is an abomination to eat it. Sea moss is not in there because it's not a fish or an animal. It's a plant. Okay. Okay. It's Same thing algae, as, as we are. Okay. You're right. It is an algae. It is not a plant. It is an algae and it grows in the water and it's also depends on which environment and climate you're in. Okay. So it is food for you. It's actually very healthy food for you to eat. And also when you're preparing it, you have to boil it. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So. Amen. Getting all of the impurities out of it. But it's not unclean because it doesn't have skins or fail. Right. <laughs> Scales are. Yeah. Let me get some of that. <laughs> I got a question. Okay. What are the seven holy angels in the Bible, and what are their purposes? Like, this is this is great. If you run into one, you'll know, like, oh, I'm about to get a message. Or so, where do we find the seven holy angels? That's the first question we have to ask, right? No, the seven spirits are not the seven angels. So first thing we're going to ask is, where do we find that? Because what if I changed it by one? I said, what are the holy eight angels? Now, you would say, show me these eight angels. Okay, I want you to show me the seven angels. Same premise. Where are we going to find them at? First, we have to examine 
are these things real or not? Yeah, seven angels is real. We find that in the book of Revelation, right? Okay. Does it give you their names? It does not give you their names. Does it tell you that they are cherubim? No, when we're reading in Revelation, it turns out that those angels are messengers. They deliver messages. Okay. Um, let me see. Watch this. Now, here's where we're going to find the seven holy angels. Go to Tobit. You have to go into the Apocrypha to find out that there are seven holy angels. And then I'm going to send you down a rabbit hole. You got to go by yourself, though. You got to go by yourself because we're out of time for today. Tobit chapter 12, verse 15. Tobit 12, 15 says, I am Raphael, one of the seven holy angels. Pause right there. Now we know that there are seven holy angels. Does that make sense? Keep going. Which present the prayers of the saints and which go in and out before the glory of the Holy One. And what do these seven holy angels do? They present the prayers of the saints. Your prayer travels from your lips in the hands of an angel to the ears of the Holy One. He travels back and forth with your prayers. Okay? Because what's the evidence of this? Daniel started praying and fasting. And the minute he started praying and fasting, an angel was sent to him. But that angel got caught up in a battle for 21 days. That was one of the holy angels. Does that make sense? And then Mikael came and helped him out. Because That's right. He was stuck there. He's so stuck with that battle. Right. So now the rabbit hole that you're going to be in is finding which are these seven angels. Let's just run off the top of our head. Uh, most of them you're going to find either in the Apocrypha or in Enoch as far as names go. What are the names of the angels that are shared in the scriptures? Who do we have? We have Michael. We have Gabriel. Not in the 66. In the 66. Uriel, but he's not in the 66. So in our regular Bible, what names of angels do we have? Not Raphael, not in the 66. We have Gabriel and we have Michael. Are these the, se the same seven which blow the trumpets in Revelation? The Bible doesn't say that. We don't know, but they're the seven holy angels. But the Bible doesn't specifically say that. Okay, so we have Gabriel and we have Michael. Then we also have Uriel. Right? We have Raphael. So Gabriel, Michael, Raphael, Uriel. That's four. How many more do we need? Three. All of them are listed in the Apocrypha. All of their names are listed in there. And also in Enoch. But that rabbit hole you'll be looking for. Would that be like, when, would that be like in Christianity when they say someone is an intercessor? Mm, kind of. Yeah. So these angels would be like interceding. Yeah, yes. Okay. The angels are interceding, but they are uh, not men. These are these are actual. set. These are actual cherubim, actual angels. Yeah, because watch man. what, and the proof of what's being said in Tobit is found in the New Testament. When Gabriel introduces himself, he tells you that he does exactly what was said in that verse. Luke chapter 1, verse 19. Luke chapter 1, verse 19. Go ahead. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of Elohim, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. So he says, I'm Gabriel. That's who I am. I stand in the presence of the Most High. I travel back and forth with messages from him to you and to you back and forth. And I'm sent to you to give you this message and you try not to receive it. So he says, I tell you what, verse 20, read verse 20. He says, and behold, thou shalt be dumb. So you can't speak no more because what you're saying goes against the message that I came here to give you. Keep going. And not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Amen. So, 
all of the angels' names are written there in the scriptures. Any other last minute questions, comments, or concerns? Very well. Thank you everybody for being here for our new member Bible study, especially those that came from very far out of town. I have enjoyed all of this time that we've been spending together. We hope to see you again soon. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray and we will wrap it up. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to get into your scriptures. We ask that you would allow us to be doers of this word that we read and not just hearers only. In Yahweh's name I pray. Amen. Amen.